Hello, and welcome to another session of Ask Nurse Linda. It's always a pleasure to be here with you. And you know, I sit here on camera, but there are other people behind the scenes that are doing everything to make the magic happen. So I want to say thank you to Julie and Donna, who are with us today, and welcome to Kelly, who's new today. So it's kind of nice to see, you know, all these people and get to know all these people at the Reeve Foundation. It's always so much fun. It makes me think of knowing people at the Reeve Foundation, and I was lucky enough to be able to work with Christopher Reeve in his recovery project for a number of years, and it was such a fabulous experience. Um, working with any patient is a fabulous experience, but there were so many things that were new to me that came along uh, with him in in things like big government grant funding and and uh, going before Congress and just all kinds of things. But anyway, we became pretty good friends. You know how people always, if they talk about Christopher Reeve, they'll say, you know, he was such a wonderful man. And indeed, that word hardly even describes him. It was so fantastic. And so um, I was walking down the hall the other day and they were having some vote in Congress and I it stirred up a memory in my brain. And and I remember the time I, I just happened to be sitting at my desk. This is a few years ago. In fact, it was long enough ago that we used the telephone. We didn't have Zoom or we had computers, but we didn't do that much on them like we do today. But anyway, um, so the phone rang. I was just sitting in my office and um I hear this man talking and he's he it's somebody I don't know and he he explains who he is he's senator somebody's aide and um they're about to do the roll call and I should listen in and I'm like what are you what are you talking about I mean you know politics is not my bailiwick at all I know nursing and I know rehab nursing but you know there are other aspects in life that I'm just like yeah okay I'll I'll let somebody else take care of that for me but but anyway, apparently when they have a roll call on a, on a bill that they're trying to pass or some public issue that they're passing, they have people that have worked on these projects and they get they call them and you get to listen in while the roll call goes on and hear everybody vote and all that sort of thing go on. And so um, Christopher Reeve had worked on this big project. Uh, funding project for people with uh, spinal cord injury and paralysis. And he had done, a, you know, in, he was very politically minded and he had done a lot, a lot, a lot of work on this. But instead of him listening, he so no, call this woman, Linda Schultz, and let her listen. What a gift. I mean, I, you know, I was just beyond the pale moved by this, but just all kinds of things that he used to do. He he was just uh, really such a hero. My husband had a spinal cord injury from disease and so a little bit different from trauma. So I'm very aware when people, when people talk about, oh no, I, I have spinal I cord injury, but I have this disease. And, you know, that gets confusing for a lot of people because they don't identify with the disease, but the paralysis is the same. And, and, um, so sometimes he just call my husband. Well, you don't know me. My name's Chris Reeve. I work with your wife and they just chat, you know, and he would call up a lot of people if he found somebody who was newly injured, um, especially teens, he would call them up and encourage them in those early days. And so he just, you know, he, he did a lot of things for individuals. But he also did all these wonderful things for the group as its entirety. And so the things that he accomplished in his life was just just phenomenal. So we have um, we have uh, we have him to uh, thank for a lot of the research that has gone on. That he was such a champion for all that kind of thing. And you know, if you're interested in some of these new, you know, the the fruits of all those labors are coming to fruition right now. And so that's really an, ex it's really exciting to be back there at not, I can't say not at the beginning, because I'm not that old, but to be back there at the, at the start when things were really starting to take off. And then he just blew it out into outer space with everything because of his notoriety gathered attention for the issue. And, and so he really moved, he really moved things along quite, quite literally. And now it's all coming to fruition. I, and if you're interested in these things, great. 
if you're doing fine the way you are and you don't want to participate in any of those things, that's fine too. Just, I think it's important to know what's going on because there might be a time when you might say, oh, you know, that might be just the thing for me. Some, I know some people I talk to in the community, they're very excited about a lot of things and they want to jump on board right now. Some people want to wait, let's get these things going, have a few more people do this new, um, you know, stimulation programs and new medications and all these new things that they're coming up with. And then um, other people are like, yeah, I, I just feel comfortable with the way I am. And so all those things are, are you know, correct in uh, your decision because you have to do what's right for you. So don't ever feel like, you know, I don't endorse anything, but I like to get that information out to people about what's going on. So there's a question about the coliplast system. And so there are some different, uh, coliplast is a uh, catheter uh, company and they develop a lot of different catheters. So depending on what you're talking about in the coliplast system, um, their catheters are great. A lot of people like them. Uh, they have um, some different um, products that they have, um, some bowel flush out systems. You might want to cautiously think about those if, you know, it depends on how they work. So I'm, it's a great company. So that's, you know, that's just all I, um, uh, that's, you know, I, unless I, you have a specific system in mind, that's about, oh, a rectal, oh, the rectal system. Yes. Um, so that is, um, something you really want to think about. Uh, there are people that have that and love it. There are people that have that and hate it. So um, I, I shouldn't use the I shouldn't use such strong words, but you know it's really a continuum. Some people like it a lot, and some people aren't too fond of it. Um, for some people, it's a little hard to get it set up. They have a call uh, nurses on call that if you decide to get that system, that you can call them because the setup it it. When I see the videotape of it, I think, how could this be hard? And yet it is for some people. I think sometimes if you don't have good hand function and there's a lot of cleanup after it, um, it doesn't work for some people's bowels so well. It's, you know, it's a little more convoluted. You can't do it if you're traveling a lot or if you're on the go. Um, but some people like it as an alternative. So, you know, read about it, talk to your healthcare professional because they will know about your bowel situation and they'll be able to advise you and direct you. But is it a, is it a good system? Sure, it's a good system. Uh, is it for everybody? Well, it might not be for every single person, but it's certainly good for a lot of people. Is it safe? Uh, yeah, it's pretty safe if it's used correctly. So, you know, there's a lot of detail on, on that and how to use it. But again, they have a call system that you just uh, call up and, and they'll talk you through whatever your issue is. So yeah, it's, it's a pretty safe system to use. Um, and there's a question about here, um, uh, what are the best prokinetic drugs? Hmm. I'm not really sure that I have an answer for the best one. I think because any drug that you take um, is good for you if you need it and if your body requires what that drug has to offer. And so I think that's a question that you have to know which drug and what your intended use is going to be instead of just um, commenting on it. Uh, dependency on the drug. Well, that's a good question as well. It uh, depends on the drug. Some of them are um, non-dependent. Sometimes when you take a drug, your body gets accustomed to that drug and they, it stops making the uh, hormone or the naturally made um, chemical reaction in your body because it's getting the reaction from this drug. So sometimes it slows down. So again, those are questions that you probably need to talk to your healthcare professional specifically for your needs. Sometimes people see drugs advertised. These drugs are not necessarily advertised on TV, but sometimes people see different things. A lot of the uh, manufacturers are uh, promoting their drugs directly to patients so that they'll go to their doctor and request them because there's so many drugs out there. 
But sometimes people have the idea, oh yeah, well, I think that would be the drug for me. And it's not for some reason in your particular body makeup. So always check with your healthcare professional about uh, those kind of things, drugs or any kind of treatment that you want to use. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some drugs with somebody who's having pain, and that's going to be a perfect example. But I'm going to wait till we get there because it's going to be disjointed if I don't talk about it within that context. So there's more to come on that subject. Um, So here's a person that's um, a spinal cord survivor of 29 years. They just started a blad, uh, bladder irrigation uh, three times weekly, and they're having shoulder issues from overuse, need to talk transfers. So I don't know if the shoulder issues are from hooking up the bladder irrigation, but I think they're from the transfers. Um, so, you know, some people, the whole line of thinking about bladders is changing. If you go back and listen to the professional webinar I did with Dr. Suzanne Grow, she talks a, a lot about um, bacteria in the bladder and how it's not always a bad thing. And when you think about it, the body runs on what we call in healthcare homeostasis. Everything like has to be in equilibrium. So in your heart, you have chemicals that regulate your heart beating and they have to be in equilibrium. If one of those chemicals slows down, it affects the beating of your heart and you know you have to take medication to correct that or you have to have different um, procedures to correct that. So um, the whole issue with care of the bladder is, is evolving, but it's still new and it's not widely accepted out there, but there's a lot of studies that are going on with bladder and uh, bacteria in the bladder and that maybe that's homeostasis that there's, you know, in nursing school and medical school, you are taught there should never be bacteria in the bladder, zero. And that is the way of thinking. That's one of those truisms in healthcare that you, you, it's just, that's true. And that has been true, but they're starting to think differently about it. And maybe there's, if there's a bacteria or two that come out in your urine or in in your urine test, it's come out. So maybe you don't need treatment unless it's at a certain amount in your bladder. Anyway, this is really forward thinking. So it's just something, something to think about. It's not actualized yet. Don't go saying, well, there's this nurse and and she said that you can have a little bit of bacteria in your bladder. That's that's against what we're practicing right now. We want to keep that that urine sterile right now. But in the future, we're going to see some changes in that. So I'm just preparing you that that there's a lot coming down in the road in the bladder. But people are going to these bladder irrigations. They're being recommended by urologists for different people. And it seems to help uh, UTIs and reduce for people who have a lot of UTI problems. Now, some of the issues with um, UTI, what they're discovering is because some people just seem to do everything right and they have them all the time. Other people, yeah, I didn't particularly wash my hands. I just catheterize, however, and, you know, I've never had a UTI, so I'm not going to worry about it. Well, apparently what seems to be going on, what we think is going on is it's a problem in the autonomic nervous system that regulates the things in your bodies, like um, um, when it, it, it detects an invader. So when you have paralysis, sometimes that autonomic nervous system is not working quite up to par and it doesn't recognize that invader or it can't call up your own body's antibodies. Uh, your own body antibodies to combat that invader. And so, um, so, so it's probably more a problem with autonomic nervous system than what people are, are probably doing, but that is all under study as well. But what I'm trying to say to you is that some people have chronic urinary tract infections and they're worried, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? They might not be doing anything wrong. It might be a problem with their autonomic nervous system. So they're investigating more in the autonomic nervous system. And if they could do something to make that more powerful and work more functionally uh, in the body, that's going to 
that's going to solve a whole lot of problems. So people are very interested in these kind of things right now. But I do want to talk transfers because this is so important. I am happy to tell you that in transferring, um, healthcare medical people have always known about the toll that transfers takes on your arms and your shoulders. Our arms are big and strong and we build up our muscles in our arms, especially if you have to transfer. But no matter how much you can build up that power in your arms, you are never going to have the power that your legs have to move your body around because the muscles are smaller and the joints are, are um, actually very, the ball and socket joint in the shoulders, the ball and socket joint in the hip. And then you've got a joint at the knee that's joint in the elbow. Your ankle is equivalent to your wrist and you have your foot with all those bones, like in the, your hand, and then you have your toes. So the structure is very much the same, but the power is less because everything is miniaturized compared to your legs. So a lot of payers now are realizing that they should start paying for assistive transfer devices now because that will avoid problems further down the road where you might have to have a joint replacement or you know if if you lose one of your arms in functioning even temporarily while you're having surgery you're not going to be able to transfer you have to have more help you might even have to go into a long-term care facility while you're recuperating so there's all kinds of complications that go with along with transferring so check with your healthcare provider to see if you can get a uh, transfer assist device in your home. Now those, you can't always take those out because you know they're lifts or um, big pieces of equipment. So you can't take it with you wherever you go, but that certainly cuts down on the number of transfers that you're doing. And so that reduces a lot of that pressure on your joints and on your muscles and your arms and on your upper body. So talk to your health, people who are aging with paralysis are a lot of times uh, eligible now for transfer assistance um, equipment. Now, some people learn to transfer with the transfer board and you can take that wherever you go. So you're not, you have to pick up your body a little bit, but not fully lift your body from spot A to spot B as if you're doing it without a transfer board. A lot of times people have those, they learn to transfer with those and then they just kind of chuck them because it's just quicker, easier, faster to use their arms. But even using a transfer board and help slide you across, you have to transfer up onto the, you know, you, well, you put the transport transfer board under your thigh and then you kind of move along, but you do have to pick up at that spot where the transfer transfer board is under your leg because you can get your skin caught in between there and your chair or the bed or whatever. But it's a lot less work on you to even use a transfer board transfer board. Another thing for your shoulders is when you're propelling your wheelchair, and there's been a lot of uh, research, Carrie Morgan, for one, has done a lot, and, and there's um, another person's last name is Rice, and um, they've done a lot of work on studying transfers, and they're both um, use wheelchairs, but, and there's uh, many others as well, but um, as far as propelling your wheelchairs, they both have studied and come to the conclusion. They study the ergonomics. They look at people. They, you know, they look at people who've had trouble, people who haven't had trouble. If you're propelling your wheelchair, always start with your arm straight down so that your arm, your hand would be in alignment with where your axle of your wheel is. Everybody want to wants to push push back, grab as far back on the wheel as they can and give that big wheel a spin, which putting a lot of stress and tension on your shoulder. You can still make as good a time if you start with your arm directly down at your side, straight down along the trunk of your body, grab the top of your wheelchair and just push forward. It's a little smaller bit of an arc that you're pushing, but that's another thing that's going to help your shoulders immensely. So yes, Talk with your healthcare professional. You might be eligible um, for a transfer assist device. Now, when I started again, back in the dark ages, when I started, we never encouraged anyone to use a transfer device, sometimes a sliding board, but we never did because we wanted people to go out and they wouldn't be able to transfer out if they had to have this big 
bulky equipment with them. But now people are kind of seeing the error of that ways, not only for the patient, but also for the healthcare uh, worker and how that even using good body mechanics, you know, those of us that are older, we're, we're having the results of lifting people for, you know, all these years. And it's really more of a balanced counterbalance things, but you are doing some heavy uh, lifting work in, in regards to that. So look into those um, transfer training things. Those are going to be very, very helpful. The next question is about civil, civil liberties and enforcing uh, environmental illnesses, cancers from the environment, and looking for um, equity in those kinds of things. And there's a lot of things that are coming up. We hear about it on TV where things that have been used, products that have been used, that have been carcinogenic, people are getting these huge uh, lawsuits that you, uh, payouts, you know, they're advertising these on TV. Now, as far as um, the air that we breathe or uh, water that we drink, th that has been a little slower to come to fruition. I know where I live, there's not too far from where I live. There was an area that uh, toxic waste was dumped and there were a lot of people there um, that live near this to toxic waste dump that has had cancer. And it's an, it's an ongoing battle, even down to who's going to clean it up. Well, it's got to be cleaned up. So it's a big lawsuit. Should it be the government? Should it be the company? Well, the company doesn't exist anymore. So who's it going to be? It's, you know, it gets also convoluted, but yes, we need some clearer laws on these sort of things. You know, in working in pediatrics, um, there was a, a, an interesting uh, situation that happened. We we would like to put children with the same diagnosis for their long-term follow-up on the same day. And so we had three children that came in, boom, boom, boom. And they all came in from the from the same area. It was a rural area, but they all came in from the same area. And the, all three of these children had an unusual type of brain tumor. But just because of the way that was scheduled for, you know, for the convenience, we want to see all these children on the same day. And, and so it was just kind of a serendipity kind of situation. But once it became apparent, oh, wait a minute, three children with this very unusual type of tumor, all from the same place, something's amiss. And the health department got involved. And indeed, there was a problem in that community. And so that, you know, led to a cleanup. And so that was, a, you know, it things get worked out, but in very unusual ways. But yes, I agree with you completely. We need some better guidelines on that. The next question is a complete uh, a quadriplegic for 15 years. He has, I, I'm saying he it could be a, a girl, um, abdominal lower back pain and bladder pain. It's, it's a borderline unbearable. And then he lists the medications that he's tried, which is gabapentin and Lyrica. Both of those are nerve pain medicines. They're prescribed for nerve pain. So if this horrible low back pain is neurogenic pain, those two medications are the ones that would be used to treat that. Nerve pain is neurogenic pain. If it's pain from something else, then they wouldn't be the drugs of choice. Now you've been on those and I don't know if you've gone up in the dose, you have to be on them for so, about six weeks and then you can go up in the dose and it's very long onboarding process to get to get to the right, the amount that's correct for you. And so those are the two. So you've tried those. If you haven't tried going up on them, that might be a chance. It's so also tried uh, Percocet and methamphetamines. Those will not help neuropathic pain at all. They do nothing for neuropathic pain. Those work to dull your pain receptors in your brain so you don't sensate pain as well, but the pain is still there. So it will not help those. It just kind of dulls your brain about that. That's why we don't give um, um, uh, opioids and those kind of uh, narcotics anymore for neuropathic pain because it doesn't do anything for it. The person is still left with that pain. Now, if you've tried all that and none of that has worked, 
this is a very interesting thing. If this is in fact neuropathic pain, um, people who have seizures and take anti-epileptic medication and people who have depression and take antidepressant medication and have paralysis with neuropathic pain rarely have neuropathic pain because the, these medications, the side effects is it's a counter action to neuropathic pain. So if you don't want to take seizure medications or antidepressant medications, if you don't have that, but in very, very small doses, sometimes people will take those um, medications and it works for them. So that's another alternative. If this pain is so bad and it's just irretractable and it is neuropathic pain, probably, and, and none of the medications are working, you can get a pain pump put in that is a pump that goes in your abdomen and it's a little tube that runs around and goes in the canal where your spinal cord is and it bathes the spinal canal. Um, people take it a lot for uh, tone, which is, we used to call spasticity. Now we call it tone. Um, and so for spasms, people would have a baclofen, baclofen pump put in and it would bathe the lower spinal cord and it would re reduce these spasms and would make life more tolerable. You can also have one of these pumps put in, it's still the same baclofen pump, but you can have medication put in there that will bathe the spinal cord. And um, so the pain is a lot less. It, the medication doesn't go through your whole body system. It only goes around that spinal cord and then it's excreted through uh, your uh, waste system. So it doesn't go up through your brain and it doesn't go consistently through your body. So it, there's a lot less side effects from that. And you can take a lot larger dose. That's another thing. And uh, after that would be something, um, uh, functional electrical stimulation, um, implanted device to break up uh, the pain receptor in that area. So that would be another uh, thing to consider. So that's kind of the hierarchy of how all of that goes. So good luck on that. But there's a couple of things to ask your healthcare provider if you're eligible for uh, pain pump medication or if a nerve stimulator implanted would help in that particular area. Sometimes they can put them on the skin and that will break that uh, transmission of that pain going to your body. So, you know, well worth the chance. If you can get something that you don't have to have surgery for all the better, if it's just something you take to your skin and it, it breaks up that pain message going to your brain, all the better. That's, you know, it's, it's a much lower risk. Um, the next question is about a person with intermittent pain between the ostomy and super uh, pubic uh, catheter site. So um, that's kind of a, a tricky question for me. Um, what could that be? There could be some kind of track or fistula connecting the ostomy and the super pubic catheter, catheter that can't be seen. So you might want to have... Um, an x-ray done with a dye inserted so they can see if there's any kind of little track in there that's developed. Sometimes that happens. Even if the two sites aren't that close together, they they tend to find their way to each other. Like a, a little fistula in one will work its way up just to the spot that you don't want it to go always because you know that is life. Things always happen just the way you don't want it to happen. And so there could be a little track in there. That would be my first guess about that. Another thing could be that there could be a little nerve that's maybe entrapped somewhere in either of those um, sites. So that would be another thing that you could look into. But um, since we don't know that much about where the ostomy is and where the, and, well, we know where the suprapubic is because that's always in the same spot. But that would seem to me like that might be that there's some kind of connection either from a nerve that's gone a little haywire in there or um, maybe a fistula between the two of them that's so tiny that you don't see leak leakage coming between the two of them one way or the other. It doesn't say what level of, um, it says quad, male quad. So it doesn't say if you're complete or incomplete. Ironically, when people have uh, pain, neuropathic pain, it's often really a good thing. It doesn't feel good. 
it's impossible often to live with, but it's a good thing because it means some nerve is connecting something to your brain. So something's working, but not always is it working in a, a functional sort of way that it's uh, enhancing your quality of life. Sometimes it's things like this that's just driving you bonkers because you can't get any relief out of it. So it's a good news, bad news kind of thing. Um, here's one who has a C5, C7 incomplete, wanting to know about stem cell research. Funny you should ask, because this has been on my mind lately. I always, whenever I go someplace and, and talk to people, it's always the stem cell research. What has come up with that? Well, I'll tell you, um, back when the heyday of stem cells, now stem cells were worked on for a long time, but then it became a possibility in recovery of paralysis and in recovery of a lot of diseases. And it was on the news and it got wrapped up with this whole issue um, with aborted fetuses that had nothing to do with each other. So you do not need an aborted fe fetus to get a stem cell. In fact, it's better if you use your own stem cell and they're taking them from way up in the nose, way, way, way up in the nose. Um, and they, they even have a way of developing them from skin cells. But they were taking them from um, um, pigs for a while. And, and if, in fact, I'm sure they're still doing that. But um, it was much more prominent at that time because that was before they figured out the nose and the skin thing. But but it all got twisted up because it all, no. Oh, and there's a notice up there. There's more information about the stem cell research. So one of the things that was interesting about it at the time was they had to make sure that if stem cells were put into someone, that they would stay in the spine and they wouldn't grow outside of the spine. And so they found out that they could do that. And then they had to figure out how to put the stem cells in that cavity where the spinal cord injury is, or in the brain where the injury is, or wherever the, how do they get it to that spot? Well, when in the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, um, in the spinal cord, when you have an injury, it doesn't matter if your spinal cord is dented on the outside, the damage is it erosion like a little cyst in the center of the spinal cord. And so you have to go through healthy tissue with a needle to inject that into that cyst. And so how do, how do you do that? Because you put that needle through healthy spinal nerve tissue, it's going to do some damage. Well, they figured out to clamp it on a vertebrae above and below where, where the target cyst was, and that would do less damage. So they, they worked a lot on that. Then once they got in the, the stem cells in the cyst, they had to make sure that um, they would grow and attach the nerves above and the net nerves below. And the cyst has kind of like a little covering on it. And so how do you break through that covering? And they got they they're got through that. And then they got uh, a scaffolding that you can put in microscopic scaffolding that would go inside the cyst that would help the stem cells grow appropriately up and down. And, and so there's been a lot of progress on that. Now they're still doing stem cell research and they're still making a lot of improvements. But it's funny that you should ask because I was just thinking about this and wondering why after all these years, has there not been more going on about the stem cells? Because we were all, you know, mesmerized and we all know that this is a great possibility, but exactly the details of how it would all work was not, you know, but now we've worked out a lot of that, but they're still working on it. Most of the work is being done in the research laboratory, not so much in people, but there is some that's going on. So we still have to stay tuned and hold on. So that is still very viable. It's work that's being continued. It's work that's progressing and is progressing at a pretty fair, fairly rapid pace, but we just have to hold on a little bit uh, longer about that to see what's going to happen there. But but things are really coming along nicely in that area. So what does that mean? Well, there's a lot of progress, but we're not there yet. Okay, so we have to hold on and wait a little bit more. Um, the next question is, what functions do various level of the spinal cord uh, perform? 
uh, that is a huge question because when you have your spinal cord exam and they do that, um, you know, where they go down with the pin down these different spots in your body, does, they're not just randomly picking spots. They're, they're studying every dermatome of your body. So uh, where you're at each vertebrae in your spinal cord, there are nerves that are coming out along that spinal cord and the nerves per connect, you know, the ones higher up in the neck, control your breathing. And then you come down a little bit further and you, you know, you might get some shoulder movement and then you've got the, um, your arms, which are controlled by nerves from the cervical and some nerves from the thoracic area. And then you go down a little bit further and um, you have the thoracic area, which are the vertebrae that have ribs attached to them. And so that is, is a lot of trunk. And then that goes, those nerves go down into uh, the lower body. And then you have the lumbar area, which has a lot to do with the bowel and the bladder and um, uh you know, the internal uh, body functioning has the organs. They have some nerves that come out in different locations. Uh, the phrenic nerve, which helps you breathe, the vagus nerve, which helps you digest. And then um, those are up in uh, higher up in the uh, spinal cord. And then you have the sacral area, which is also the cauda equina, the sacral nerves. Now those are peripheral nerves and those can be operated on. And those can be transferred and grafted and you can get a uh, function in your sacral nerves with that procedure. And it's done today. So that's something the the nerves in the cervical, thoracic and lumbar area are our uh, central nervous system nerves. Those are not yet able to be manipulated like the peripheral nerves that are all the nerves in the rest of your body. So like if you tap your the back of your hand, that's a nerve that's sending a message up to your brain that, that something's tapping on my hand, or I have an itch, or I'm going to sneeze, or, you know, all these kinds of things. Um, I'm feeling pain, those kinds of things, or I'm hungry. Um, all that is transferred through the central nervous system. So there's a tutorial that's just been put up in the question and answer box as well, so um, that tutorial will help you see. Now, if you, you can Google, and in that tutorial, I'm sure there's a picture of the dermatomes. And so you'll see exactly what dermatome affects what part of your body. And so when you when you know that, that you know uh, what function you have. Now, in spinal cord injury, once you have that spinal cord injury, and once the spinal shock is over, so that, you know, your body goes in, your spine goes into shock immediately if you have trauma. Um, it, it, it's more gradual and you don't really have that spinal shock when you have a uh, spinal cord injury from disease. Cause you know, like an injury is like, boom, it's there. So if you have an injury, you know, if you cut your finger, if you break your arm, boom, you have that injury, it's there. With disease, it takes more time for the disease to progress. So it, it's kind of a slower uh, intake to your condition. But generally with a spinal cord injury, you don't usually have progression. So if you have progression, they're going to look for something else. And that's usually a cyst. That cyst in the spinal cord is enlarging. And so there's a surgery that they do that's pretty rare. So we don't really have to think too much about that. Um, but we do have to know that that's a possibility. Now, um, when you when you look at the nerves, you have motor nerves that create the movement, and that's your brain sending a message down to move your finger. The stove is hot. You move your hand before you can even like think about it. And then your sensory nerves are the nerves that carry the messages up to the brain. So you put your finger too close to the stove, and it says it's hot. That message gets up, and your motor. Uh, nerves get activated and boom, that finger goes off. It happens all so quickly that the, the processing of information is really, really quickly, quickly done. So um, how do these various levels perform? Well, if it's up above the injury, you're, you're going to be doing um, 
you're going to have complete motion and sensory function as you did before. If it's below the spinal cord injury, you might have, if you have a complete injury, that does not mean completely severed so, spinal cord. It means that the injury to the spinal cord is a complete injury, meaning that no messages get through that particular level where your injury is. A lot of people get, even healthcare people, oh, you have a complete injury. That means your spinal cord is severed. No, it does not. Severing of the spinal cord is extremely rare. It, it's almost impossible to have your spinal cord severed, but a complete injury means the messages are completely not getting through. <clears throat> An incomplete injury means some messages are getting through. So you might have some sensation, you might have some movement. Complete injury is it's radio silence below the level of the spinal cord injury. Now there's a thing called the ZPP, zone of uh, partial injury. I can't remember what the uh, Z is ZP something. Anyway, it's the zone of ZPP, zone of partial preservation. I'm sorry. I was having a brain mishap there. Um, what that means is that's the transition area where you, from where you have your usual function and then you have your lack of function below that. And that's sometimes a little bit of a space. So your spinal cord injury might be a little bit different or it might be a little bit higher on one side and a little bit lower on the other side. And um, it doesn't always match up equally across. So they, they also take uh, this ZPP and the sensations might be weird in there. So you just kind of don't know uh, what's what what that is. And it's gonna be a little different for everybody. So you might have, when you, they do the ASIA exam, the last completely functioning nerve is your level of injury. You might have a ZPP or that zone of transition where you might have like more of an incomplete kind of sensation before you get down to the complete area. So that's kind of the way all that works. But look at the um, look at that little tutorial because it explains it all in much more detail than I have time to do today. But also, if you just want to uh, Google uh, nerve dermatomes with an M, uh, you'll see it'll come up. There's a lot of graphics and images, and it'll show you know a man standing there with their arms out, and and it'll be different colors for which part of the body matches up to which part of the vertebrae and the nerves that connect with them. There's also a picture where there's a man that's bent over with his arms in front of him, like kind of like standing like a dog, but not with the knees bent, but bent at the hip and then their arms, but they're bent over. And if you look at that picture, you'll see that the body is, when the body's divided out like this, it's kind of like, well, this nerve does this and this does this. But when you see it with that body bent over, it's like somebody's just sliced a loaf of bread and it's all makes perfect sense when you see that bent over one. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a little uh, interesting kind of thing to, to study. Um, it's, it's just kind of, kind of neat to see how all of that works. Uh, are there any preven preventable measure treatments for urinary tract infections? And we talked about urinary tract infections. And yes, there are some preventions. And there are things that um, people don't even think about, but they're very helpful. So for instance, moving your body. Now, if you have paralysis from a stroke, from a spinal cord injury, from a neurological disease, say you're wheelchair bound, your body is sitting and your body is just being still all the time. You need to move your legs and move your bodies because you know that old song, it's getting to be howling, you know, the shin bones connected to the knee bone, the, you know, well, the muscles are all connected to the same too. So if you move those big muscles in your thigh, Either if you can move your legs yourself, if you can have somebody manually move them, if you have um, some orthotics that you use to walk, but you kind of put them back in the closet because, you know, they're, they can be exhausting to you sometimes, get them out and use them one time a day just for exercise. 
and um, build up your strength with that. But move your thighs as much as you can, because that will stimulate the muscles in your abdomen, which will help your bladder shake your bladder, and it will help your bowel function, and it will help spasticity or tone if you have that problem. So it's very, very helpful. You might have to have somebody move those uh, heavy legs for you, but be sure and move them. People who do... Um, Electrical stimulation, if they do the electrical biking, have less urinary tract infections because of the movement. So movement is very critical to our bodies. So that's one thing you can do. But even just picking up the leg and moving it around. When you're uh, in bed at night, before you go to sleep, if you can, or have somebody else, roll back and forth. Again, you're shaking up that bladder. You're moving that bladder. It's just one of those things that's just really important to do. If your bladder's shaken, not stirred like James Bond or what, whatever he liked in his drink, you know, I always think of use the James Bond method, shake it up stir it up, <laughs> get that bladder fluid, get that urine moving in there. Because the more you do that, the less chance the bacteria has to clump together. When it clumps together, it starts multiplying and it really goes to town. So the more you can eliminate that, the better off you'll be. Also look at um, what you put into your body. So what you drink, avoid sugar. Sh bacteria loves to live off sugar. So the more you drink sugary drinks, sodas, uh, an Arnold Palmer, uh, even artificial sugars tend to uh, help feed bacteria. So you don't want to drink, um, you know, there's a lot of sports drinks now, uh, protein drinks, they have a lot of sugar in them. So be sure and, and look at that sugar content on that. Also food, you think, well, food's going to come out through the stool, not through the urine, but there's fluid in food. So if you're, if you're eating something, um, the fluid's going to come out of, as your body metabolizes that food and it's going to come out through the bladder. Another thing is um, a huge thing is nicotine or any products that you're taking, vaping. I know people always want to say, oh, no, vaping's perfectly fine. No, there's there's chemicals in there. It's going to come out through the bladder. You know, uh, bladder cancer for people who smoke is second only to lung cancer. So, you know, it's like really prominent in that. So be careful with all of those kind of things. Now, we talked about um, the um, irrigations, if you want to talk to your healthcare professional about that. But again, they're coming up with these new treatments. And, um, you know, we're going to see how things are going to change. If you do get a bladder infection, get it treated early, because you can use a lower type of um, antibiotic People always want to go for, oh, I need a Z-Pack. Oh, I need uh, this, you know, uh, fancy antibiotic. You always want the antibiotic that treats the bacteria you have. So you have to have a, a culture and sensitivity with your urinalysis to see what will kill this bacteria. Because if you take the wrong antibiotic, it's not going to kill the, that bacteria, the one that you need. The other thing is um, take the lowest the antibiotic, like if you, if you, if you can take penicillin, ampicillin, some of those earlier generations, because they're just going to treat the infection that you have, as opposed to wiping out all the good flora in your body and, you know, develop, a um, uh, uh, inability to, for, for, uh, antibiotics to work in your system. So some people have developed antibiotic resistance because they've used especially so many high level antibiotics. And so you want to stay with those lower level antibiotics. Um, here's another one I've been get. Oh, here's a good one. I'm a C4, uh, four or five quadriplegic. I've been getting abscesses that turn into fistulas on my body, bottom. The doctor doesn't want to do any surgery because of the way I do my bowel program. Okay. Now that is an interesting question because yes, um, those fistulas are a problem. 
and they get infected and it just, you know, leads to a whole bunch of trouble. So first of all, you want to try to avoid having a fistula because so th use the lubricant generously. People are always trying to save and economize. Medical equipment is so hugely expensive, but use the lubricant. This is not the time to uh, consolidate. Sometimes I see people, they put one little drop on their finger. Oh, as I insert it, it'll go down my whole glove. No, it won't. There's not enough on there to cover your whole glove. And a dry glove rubbing against that tender tissue in the rectum is just going to cause trouble. So use a lot of lubricant. Um, the uh, next thing to do is to try to clean these up with antibiotics. There might be some antibiotic that you can insert into the rectum to help heal those, or you might take an oral antibiotic to help clean those up. And then you just have to wait um, for those to heal up. If they get so bad, sometimes people have to have a colostomy for a period of time while they heal up. And then um, they have the colostomy reverse, which is two surgeries. So, you know, we want to try to avoid that. But, um, you know, you don't want the stool to be on in these fistulas because the stool is going to get in there and they're going to uh, get impacted. You might want to try um, the mini enema, the enemies or uh, the mini enema, which is just a small amount of fluid, maybe, uh, you know, they, it works to stimulate the nerves in the bowel. And some insurance payers will cover that with the fistulas, your, yours might. So think about that sort of thing too. Um, oh, uh, would probiotics be good for bladder management? And uh, uh, would you explain bladder ir irrigation? Probiotics were really huge. You know, everybody was taking them for the gut flora. And um, what they found out is that people overuse probiotics. So you want to be very cautious about that. So it, it um, if, if you do take probiotics for your gut, you you shouldn't take more than a month at a time unless your you know healthcare professional says no you have a different problem you need to do it differently but you should never take more than a month at a time and so would they be good for uh, bladder management there are some people who would uh, provide that argument um, the probiotics are meant to work in the gut as opposed to the bladder but then again the bladder's ridding waste and um, as the as as the probiotics work in the gut, the stool's healthier. Stool comes out very close to the urethra, in especially in women. So it, you know, there's kind of like a, a, a backward kind of thinking about it. But it could, it could possibly work. You know, I can't say yes, I can't say no. I haven't seen any research that says it could, but I've heard people have used it. Very few people that felt it was. Um, it, that felt like it it had worked. Okay, is virtual reality exercise for quad hard exercising? It's very hard for quadriplegics to get a cardiovascular workout. And that's why the functional electrical stimulation with the bikes has become so popular because you can get a cardiovascular workout. Even for people with paraplegia, it can be difficult to get a cardiovascular workout. And they'll say, well, you know, I was, I pedal, I push my chair all day and I'm moving my arms and I'm getting, it's not the, it's not the full body cardiovascular workout system that you need. There are some virtual uh, reality exercises uh, for uh, quads that you can do on the computer. Uh, there's some different games that you can play, um, but having somebody move your arms or any, any, any um, exercise that you can do, it will be helpful, but it's hard to get that uh, cardiovascular exercise without having some kind of electrical stimulation on there. And then there's a question about stretches in T3, T8 complete paraplegics um, ought to do each day. And yes, you should do your stretches. And a lot of people uh, get rid of their stretches as they go along because it's time consuming and um you know, they're just like, it's so boring. I just lay there while somebody moves me and I put my headphones on, I listen to music. We try to have a conversation, but it's so boring. 
but it's so critically important to your whole body because your body craves movement. You don't know it in the area below your injury, but it's craving movement. It helps with spasticity. It helps with bowel. You can even just make your mental health better. Movement of your body is just critical. If you feel it or if you don't, it's just critical. Um, there's somebody who wrote in about a clinical trial in Louisville that injected an open uh, probiotic capsule mixed with uh, sterile water through the catheter and left it for 20 minutes, they flushed out. I have heard of that trial and I had heard that it was um, successful, but it was a small number of people. So they have to do a bigger study with more people, but they did like the results that they got. And so they're continuing that work. And yes, I was real excited when I heard about that. Um, have I heard about any arguments against electrical stimulation? Yes, there is an argument against it. And that is that when the electrical stimulation is applied, it's applied to the motor nerves that are used to carry the messages up to the brain. And as I explained earlier, it's the sensory nerves that, that carry the messages to the brain. The motor nerves carry the messages down to the bottom. So they're kind of borrowing on that. And I hear a lot of people, not a lot of people, but I, if there's one thing I hear about ESTEM, that is the thing. Well, how does that work? Well, I can't tell you if it will do damage to those sensory nerves or not, because nobody knows the answer to that. I can tell you, I've known people that have done ESTEM for over 20 years and their nerves are all still fine. Um, so that's not a study, uh, but you know, that's something. Here's somebody who says they have a lot of AD when I do e-stim. So yes, because you're getting stimulated. So either you need to cut back on the velocity of the e-stim or do it for shorter amount of times and build up to it to get your body used to it. You know, sometimes people just uh, start on it and they're like, here you go, you know, do this. So, you know, sometimes you, sometimes people are a little more sensitive to things. Um, there's medications you can take if you're getting um, a lot of benefit from the e-stem and you're having that AD, but you need to avoid that AD. So you need, you need to either back off on the electrical stimulation, talk to your therapist about that, or um, um, there's some, uh, oral medications, sometimes nitroglycerin or nitropaste is given in emergency situations, but there are some different medications and I'm sure there's, uh, Donna's going to put up a link um, to those uh, medications for AD. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, here we go. As a representative for a, a particular county, uh, this person wanted to know about the spike in COVID, RSV, and the flu amongst the disabled and the new vaccines, which are costly for those without insurance. Yes, in the fall, um, RSV and the flu come out. They really, You can get COVID, RSV, and the flu any time of the year, but they're more prevalent and prominent as the weather changes in the cold and it starts to turn cold. Now, the flu we've all known about and we know that it's prevalent in the fall and in the winter. You can still get it in the summertime, but it's a lot less. Um, RSV is um, a virus that was um, first detected, uh, well, I don't know if it was first de detected in children, but it was real prominent in children. And it started out um, just some rare cases, and then it's, it got a little bit stronger. The virus got a little bit stronger, and it had peaks so that it ended up peaking every other year. And there were a number of cases every other year. Now it's every year. If you've worked in a pediatric hospital, you know that from the fall until a little bit in January, there's a huge peak of RSV. It's very prominent in pediatric patients. And then there's a little bit of a lull. And then there's a little after, a little echo after around in March. And you know that all winter, your beds are going to be full. You'll hear it on the news. They'll set up tents in the parking garage and, you know, because it affects the respiratory system. And of course, we all are familiar with COVID. So yes, the, and it looks like COVID is going to fall into that peak in the, uh, in the fall and in the winter, like the flu and RSV. Now they have a vaccine for RSV, which they didn't have before. It's new. And they have it for children and uh, older adults who are more susceptible. 
and people who are disabled. So all three of those, sometimes you can go to a clinic and you can get them offered for free if you go to the um, uh, health department, but this person's coming calling from the health department. So apparently they don't have that in their health department. And, um, but sometimes they're different organizations that will put on free COVID shots um, for people who need them and that can't afford to pay for them. Um, Medicare will pay for these shots. Um, so there, there are different uh, resources. So if they don't have insurance, they should be able to get on Medicare or you can still uh, go to the Affordable Care Act and get on those. Now, I know it's still impossible for some people, but, you know, we have to, you know, kind of uh, review all those different opportunities. Uh, oh, here's this question I was so interested in. How risky is a low dose estrogen patch paired with progesterone for hormone replacement therapy for women with SEI? I have so many issues with premenopause. And so she she's trying to think, yeah, sometimes one problem just overshadows risk factors. So you have to always weigh the benefits of things versus the risk of things. And those problems with perimenopause and perimenopause and menopause can be so disturbing to the body that it's very difficult. So I know she says she's looked and she hasn't found much research and there's not much research, but there's a lot of speculation. And some of the concerns are, is that with a hormone replacement therapy that in the issue with bone density, that there will be an increase for women with spinal cord injury with their bone density. So you have to have that checked very carefully on hormone replacement therapy. Also, we talked about cardiac conditioning and how people get cardiac disconditioned with paralysis. And so there, there's a more a higher risk for blood clots. So as long as you're going in with knowing the risk and the challenges and weighing the risk and the benefits, because for some women, these symptoms are just impossible to deal with. The hormone replacement therapy does um, seem to have some protections that might be beneficial to women with spinal cord injury, but no, there are no long-term studies that say yes or no. So you just have to look at all the risk and benefits of that. Um, here's a person that has uh, two spinal cord injuries, one at L4-5 and one at C6-7. They have um, uh, chronic pain syndrome and they need help for their vertigo, dizziness, fainting spells, and neck and shoulder pain. And so um, this complex regional pain syndrome is what this is called and that's what they're calling it as well. So they've been diagnosed with that. And so there is no cure for that, but there's a lot of things that can be done about it. So there are some injections that you can have that will help dull the sensation about around in that area. Um, there's, um, again, those electronic nerve stimulation stimulators that can be used. And so definitely try, if you've tried the medication, if you've tried the injections, talk to your healthcare professional about an electronic stimulator. Oftentimes they're implanted. Um, you try them on the skin first, see if it's any help, but sometimes they need to be implanted. So we're talking about this, you know, a serious situation here, but that's usually the pattern for how that goes. Um, here again, is uh, continual UTIs. So that's another, you know, we've talked about that. But, you know, now we've had several questions about that, and I appreciate all of those questions. They're all a little bit different, but I appreciate all of those because it is so critical um, that you get those tended to, but it's also critical to know that in the future that, that there's going to be more coming out about UTIs and how to treat them. So much like this uh, probiotic capsule that was just broken open and in injected into the bladder, small little study, but people are looking at all different kinds of things. Management of the autonomic nervous system and how that can help it just moving the body. That's another thing. Um, there's a lot of things people will ask. I read about this on the internet. I can buy it. It's not, you know, it's an over-the-counter thing. Should I buy this particular drug? And sometimes people tell me they tried something that worked great and they can't live without it. Other times people say, 
I tried that same thing. It was useless. So, you know, you have to look individually at all these things. Oftentimes things that are so sold over the counter, you definitely have to check with your physician because it could interact with some medications that you might be taking, or it might not just be the right thing for you. So look at all those products and what they are uh, and what they're going to do to your body and try to stay healthy. That is my message. We're entering into that cold, flu, RSV, COVID season. It's with us all the time, but, you know, be careful. Wash your hands. Uh, wear a mask if you are able to wear a mask. Um, you know, social distance. I have a lot of people that come up to me. Linda, I just got over our, the COVID. And I'm like, why are you talking to me? I'm immunocompromised. <laughs> you might still have a virus linger, lingering around in there. So it's it's a real challenging time for all of us. So I uh, maintain your health and I'll see you next month. It's always a pleasure.